The love story ends. For three days and nights after Antony was taken aboard the Egyptian flagship, Cleopatra stayed below in her cabin and refused to speak to him. For how could she? What was there to say to that crazy man who had thrown away their future? Alone in the prow of that ship, Antony sat with his head in his hands, deep in remorse over what he had done, and torn with agony because Cleopatra would not see him. When her ladies, Iris and Charmaine, were finally permitted to bring him to her, Cleopatra felt sorry for him. His eyes were like those of a whipped dog, but there was no time to waste in mourning over that, what was in the past. The battle had been lost. They must now plan to defend themselves as best they could with what forces were left to them in Egypt. She had already begun turning over various plans in her clear, active mind. Antony was of no help to her. Never having learned to control his emotions, it was now too late. They had made a wreck of him. He could only agonize and groan and threaten to kill himself as they neared Africa. At a small fort three days west of Alexandria, where they stopped for water, he refused to go any further. He wanted to stay right there on the edge of the desert and die. A few weeks later, however, the two men who had stayed with him persuaded him to go on to Alexandria, where he would could at least have a decent burial if he were still determined not to live. I am, he insisted dramatically, I am through with life. And upon reaching Alexandria, he shut himself up in a small house on the harbor at the far end of the breakwater where he need not look at nothing but the open sea and a great white lighthouse. He stayed there all winter. Then he returned to life to enjoy what little there was left of it before Octavian should arrive. For now, it was learned that Octavian had landed in Asia Minor and was marching south with a huge army along with ancient highway toward Egypt. Egypt being the only country still holding out against him, Antony knew that the end could not be far away. Why not eat, drink, and be merry then for what time was left? Returning to the palace, he rounded up old friends, organized a club called the the die togethers and spent every night with them in wild carousel carousing. Cleopatra was still busy trying to prepare for the emergency in case Alexandria should fall and the capital have to be moved to port on the Red Sea. She was having a number of Egyptian battleships dragged through some ancient canals on the Isthmus of, Sis, uh, of Suez or where the channels were filled up with sand hauled overland from the Nile to the Red Sea. To avoid capture, she planned also to have her two sons leave the country. Julius Caesar's son, who was now 17, was to go with Egyptian merchants on their summer voyage to India. Alexander, the son, 10 years old, was to be sent to Media. His twin sister, the moon, Cleopatra felt could be safely kept at home. For herself, in case of need, she was pushed forward the work on her unfinished tomb or mausoleum near the temple of Isis. Also, she was experimenting with various poisons, trying them out on criminals to see which death was the least horrible. Had she followed Octavian's advice, she would have used the poison on Antony, for by secret messenger Octavia had sent word that he would treat her kindly if she would kill Antony. But if Antony had followed the advice sent to him by Herod, he would have taken Cleopatra's life in order to save his own. Neither one was tempted, for they still loved each other, though their lives and their love story were almost at an end. By June, although Antony had led out the forces and tried to defend it, Octavian had seized the fort on the eastern border of Egypt and was camped close to the walls of Alexandria. The last night of July, his last night on earth, Antony spent drinking with the die togethers. The following day, up at sunrise and dressed in his armor, he was preparing to lead his men in a last fight against Octavian. Then, from a rise of ground where he was standing, he saw first his fleet in the harbor and then the Cal Calvary Desert and flee. Oh, sorry. He was first... He saw first his fleet in the harbor and then the cavalry 
desert and go over to the enemy, desert and go over to the enemy. Blind with rage, believing she had betrayed him, Antony rushed back to the palace, tore through the halls, howling, cursing, and damning Cleopatra. Terrified, Iris and Charmaine ran to protect their mistress, hurried her to an unfinished, unfinished mausoleum, bolted the door, and breathless and trembling ran to the upper floor. From a window they called down to some workman or servant on the ground below. Run, tell Antony the queen is about to kill herself. The man ran, but too excited to get the message straight, he told Antony that Aunt Cleopatra was already dead. At once, but too late, Antony realized that his rage had been without foundation. Cleopatra, he moaned, oh, my beloved Cleopatra, to think that I, a famous soldier, should have been slower in courage than a woman. But I shall soon be with you. Seizing a sword, he plunged it into his side, and he fell backward, unconscious. Anxious faces were bending over him when he regained consciousness. Learning that Cleopatra was still alive, he begged to be taken to her and was carried to the mausoleum. There the bolts were jammed so tightly that the women could not open the door, but there were ropes used by the workmen hanging from the roof. With them tied to the stretcher on which Antony had been carried, Cleopatra and her two women hauled him up through the window into the upper room. There he died, his head in Cleopatra's arms, her tears falling on his face. Shortly after sunset, Octavian entered the city, visited his beautiful prisoner, coolly appraised her charm with his steady, calculating eyes, and left, promising her that she would be treated honorably. Cleopatra listened in despair for the words rang false to her. Later, when she learned that he was secretly planning to display her in his Roman triumph. She broke down completely. No, she cried. No, no, no. I will not be taken to Rome to be exhibited in his triumph. No, not that. Pacing the floor, beating her small fists against her breast, tearing frantic fingers through her hair, she finally threw herself on the couch in a paradoxum of sobbing to lie there delirious for several days. Recovering her composure one day, near the end of that unhappy month, she begged permission to visit Anthony's tomb. There she bent down and kissed the cold marble slab that lay above him. O oh, Antony, dearest Antony, she whispered, if the gods below with whom you are now dwelling can or will do anything for me since the gods above have betrayed us, hide me, bury me here with you. For amongst all my bitter misfortunes, nothing has been so terrible as this short time that I have lived without you. Covering the gravestone with flowers, she then ordered a table set as for a feast. Among the delicacies brought in, was a basket of figs in which lay a small but very poisonous asp. No one was in the tomb when Cleopatra, when she died, except Char Charmaine and Iris. They had dressed her that morning in her most lovely and royal garments that they might go proudly with their queen into the unknown shadowy land beyond the gates of death. Iris was all already dead when the soldiers of Octavian broke open the tomb and entered in. Charmaine was dying, but with her, her last breath, straightening the crown of her beloved queen, who lay on a golden couch, quiet and peaceful at last, and half smiling in her sleep. Cleopatra's children by Antony were spared. Taken to Rome, they were made welcome and mothered by Octavian. Caesarian, however, was seized and executed, the last of the Potamones and the only son of Julius Caesar. Octavian now stood alone and without a rival, sole master of the Roman world of which ancient Egypt had at last become a providence. It was the year 30 BC. The month was Sectilius, the same month in which 13 years before he had been made consul, the month which would later be named August. <laughs>